I know we, we talked before about like writing and writing books and uh, it being this mm -hmm. uh, uh, significant labor, <laughs> you know, like a, uh, it's a yeah. lot of work. And I mean, you can say that it's a lot of work, but that doesn't quite encompass the, the, the totality of the experience, you know? Um, so I feel bad asking you to summarize it, but do you have, uh, have you distilled it down to kind of a summary at this point of like, what's the, if you had to say like what the main message is that you want people to take away from reading your book, uh, have you gone that far with it? Yeah, I think if, I mean, to distill the, the entire book down into a few sentences, um, it would be that game day coaching is vitally important. In fact, arguably one of the most important pieces of of powerlifting success. And so success looks different for different people, clearly, um, because of their aspirations and their objectives and the level of competition and their talent and all of these things. But as you ascend through competition, um, game day coaching becomes more critical. And in order to be an effective game day coach, I think you first need to start with um, establishing who you are as a person and what is your life philosophy, which I believe is inextricably linked to your coaching philosophy. And that's why I intentionally put that as the first chapter of the book. And so while there may not be much that's sexy about going through that exercise, um, it is rather revealing, I think. And so I just tried to lay, a, lay an early foundation in the book with, with regards to uh, coaching philosophy, and then, of course, understanding coaching psychology and how to deal with different lifters, and then how that serves as my foundation to the decisions that I make while using kind of this systematic process, if you will, that I've developed over time. So I know that's kind of a mouthful, <laughs> and you're no, probably looking the... for a single, single no, sentence. No, 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 no. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, yeah. it's I know what I'm asking at that point, you know, if you it's yeah. so my thing being centered around training and training stuff more than anything else. You know, if you're like, hey, <laughs> this still your training philosophy into a sentence. Yeah, it's kind of an unfair question a little bit. So I, I know that that uh, it's probably the same on your end. Um, but I really. I had the chance to read. Oh, the, whoop, I'm sorry. I was, we had a little bit of delay there. Um, I had a chance to read, um, I think I'm up to chapter four at this point of your book and the first chapter on philosophy and then the second chapter on psychology were just essential to me. I, I totally agree with you that, you know, understanding your values is so important because that is going to shine in how you coach. It's going to shine in how you interact with your lifters and how you interact. If you're writing training on game day, it's just, it's paramount in my opinion. So I think that starting out that way was just really smart. It's truly the foundation. And so I, I think you did a phenomenal job laying that out. And I think more coaches, lifters would be best served taking a pause and sitting back and reflecting on those things. And I think you, provided concrete evidence of how that's played out in your life, which I thought was really cool. And I want to um, just say that I was impressed with your transparency and the way you wrote everything out and the way you explained that in the book. It was very real to me, like knowing you in person and getting a chance to meet you, like everything yep. that you wrote was truly how you felt. And you could see that in the way that you coach your lifters and the way you represent yourself and the sport with other people. So I just wanted to really just say out loud that I commend you on writing that, well, taking the time and also that. being um, transparent and honest. That authenticity is, is what I was going after and just presenting my, my true self and just showing some vulnerability and showing where I've erred along the way and how those errors in judgment and performance and execution, um, you know, it, it, it humanizes you. I mean, we're all fallible. <laughs> we're all uh, perfectly flawed and perfectly imperfect. And so I wanted to kind of leverage that and show people that, that, Hey, this is, you know, this is me. And like you said, just kind of hold true to my beliefs and values and standards that I've kind of set for myself. So thank you for saying that. 
Yeah. You're welcome. And I, I like the saying of like, perfection is unattainable. Yep. Like going back to your, you know, mm -hmm. upholding the standard. I, I love that. I think that that's, that's real and honest. And one of the things that struck me about the writing was this is coming from a person who has had to develop this over time and refine this over time, mm -hmm. which you, you just shared. And I think that that's important. I, I wanted to actually ask you if it's okay. Um, what is it like to be able to handle some of the best in the world? Like, I mean, do you get nervous, Matt? Like, <laughs> like thinking about the stakes that are at, you know, the things that are at stake when you're handling these people who've poured such time, money, energy, mm -hmm. their lives into this craft. Yeah. Um, I mean, so it's gotta be nerve wracking. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to answer that. The first, the first thing is, is it's mostly thrilling. Like how, how lucky am I to be like living my passion um, and just, doing what I absolutely love doing. So I feel so fortunate and grateful and blessed to be able to coach at, at some of the highest levels. And so it's, it's thrilling. And so like, like I touched upon in the psychology chapter, I kind of frame it in my mind the same way that I like to frame it with my athletes is, you know, yeah, we all get these pregame jitters, you know, and these, that, that's natural. It's like this, you know, the fight or flight response is kicking in. And so clearly I get that too, probably even more so as a coach, because I'm not as in control of the outcomes in terms of the execution. Like, you know, when you're walking up to the bar, you know, you're like, I've got this, like, I, this is my bar. I'm in control of how this is going to go. Essentially when you're the coach, it's this hands off approach where you've, you know, you've tried to set your lifter up in the best position to succeed, but ultimately they, it's incumbent upon them to go out and do it. So, um, yeah, I just try to frame it in the same way and say, look, I'm not nervous. I'm excited because, you know, like kind of like what I talked about in the book, if we were to look at these physiological markers and actually chart them and put them on paper and graph them with regards to blood pressure, and resting heart, you know, elevated heart rate and sweaty palms and increased core temperature, all of these things, they could be rather indistinguishable if I put you in these different scenarios. You know what I mean? You're being attacked by a tiger, you know, you're about to jump off of a cliff type of thing, you know, and you're also walking up to a, to a loaded heavy barbell that you're about to squat, you know, you're particularly your opener, you know, it's all these natural um, emotions that I think kind of take place. And so I like to just frame it as, Hey, I'm excited. And, and adrenaline can help increase performance. And so let's ride that together. And so to, yeah, the, the thing I think about is it's thrilling and it's awesome. And I'm just so fortunate to be in those positions. That's, um, that's awesome that you look at it that way of it being mm -hmm. thrilling and exciting and coming alongside the lifter. Um, so how do you think that your personal values and vision mm -hmm. And kind of going back to the first chapter of the book, how do you think that that frames the way that you approach game day? Like really thinking about how you approach the lifters, their excitement, all the energy they've put in. How do you feel like all of that has, reflecting on all of that, that how that has helped you to approach the lifter yeah, I think, and I to mean, kind of partner with them? I think the way that I kind of manage my emotions and how I prepare myself and how that becomes congruent with the lifter. I think, you know, my confidence, and it's certainly not an arrogance, it's, it's just being confident, is, is steeped in how I prepare. And so, you know, just like I talked about throughout the book, it kind of permeates the, the tenor and tone of the entire book is focusing and pouring my efforts uh, into my lifters and the things that I can control. Because there's so many things that are outside of your control and, um, you know, what I can control is by communicating effectively and thoroughly, um, planning beforehand, watching videos, understanding the direction and, and, and aim of the person's training. And then, of course, collaborating with the lifter in advance um, with their programming coach, if they have one, if, if they don't program for themselves, um, discussing all these scenarios, um, reviewing them. Um, once we install the game plan, um, that I'm walking through these scenarios again in my mind. Um, and then I think it's incumbent upon me 
as I've talked with Mike about, to scout the competition. And whether or not you think scouting is, is valuable, um, I happen to think that it is. And, and while I can't control what others do, I think it's unwise of me and myopic to at least not consider their past performances, their tendencies, um, and at least just familiarize myself with them so that I'm, I have an awareness of what they might do given a certain scenario or situation. And so, and then before game day, kind of leading into game day, you know, I make sure that I do some self-care, that I take care of myself, you know, that I'm tr well rested, well hydrated, well fed, so that I can be alert and sharp when it matters most, because my lifters are counting on me to, to make good decisions and, and be in their corner, both literally and figuratively. So, um, yeah, so, and, and, you know, based upon the values chapter of what I, or what are in philosophy and so forth, I think that kind of what I try to do is surround myself with like-minded people in terms of our values, what, what is important to us, you know, not necessarily belief systems or training approaches or any of that stuff, because that stuff can become dogmatic and, you know, we all know how that goes. So it's, it's more important to me that I'm aligned with like-minded people that are cut from a similar cloth. So I, I know that's kind of a roundabout answer, but I hope that gets it with the heart of what you were looking for. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm sure that it does. And I think one thing that stands out to me and, you know, I've seen you do this a lot over the years is the amount of preparation that goes into actually coaching people at a high level. And I, I don't think that, coaching is thought of as a performance as much as, you know, an athletic performance. It's like, it's, it's obvious that, you know, feats of athletic skill is a, is a performance that needs to be trained and prepared for adequately. But coaching is also that, you know, and coaching in competition is that, you know, I coaching outside of competition is that too. You know, if, if you're getting to the point of like writing training programs, if you're sleepy, if you're uh, <laughs> distracted, you know, like those things will affect decision making all the way up and down the chain. So I, I think it's really important. You know, do you something? The question just kind of popped up for me while you were talking is, uh, do you have any observations about um, coaching under fatigue or anything like that? Like to maybe give a little bit more context, uh, some of these competitions that we go to are long, you know, uh, they can be many days and coaches a lot of times are coaching lots and lots of lifters for very long hours. You know, <laughs> I'm thinking of coaches that I know who will be at a competition, maybe less so in the last couple of years, but, you know, close to two weeks coaching in almost every session, you know, and by the end, they're looking visibly worn out. <laughs> and I wonder, yeah. do you have any observations on like uh, differences in decision making due to due to that? I, I assume that there must be. I would feel like if I was in that scenario, I would feel like my decisions were influenced a bit, at least a bit. Uh, but I don't know if it comes out in any sort of data or anything. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I, I've tracked any, you know, tangible physical data in terms of, you know, a coach submitting a bad attempt or making a wrong decision or something like that. But, you know, I, I talked about this on another podcast, but I'll bring it up again. And Mike, you can certainly identify this with this because, you know, you were on these raw national teams, these U.S. national teams for four or five consecutive years, starting in 2012 at the World Cup. And you remember when we went to that in Stockholm, Sweden, right? Mm -hmm. The World Cup in yeah. Sweden. And it was essentially, you know, while that was the IPF's way of test driving this whole idea of a raw world championships, we knew at the time, hey, that's still a raw worlds, even though that was yeah. kind of a small one. <laughs> but you'll recall that it was just open lifters, right? And so it was, you know, Angela Simons and Melinda Baum kind of partnered in where the, you know, Angela did most of the work but they were the, the co-head coaches. And then of course I was an assistant and worked with you and some other lifters as well. But then do you remember when we went to Russia and then even the following year in South Africa, man, that team exploded in size. And so 
Angela, I mean, literally and figuratively, if, if you may recall, because I certainly recall, by the end of the week, she was experiencing, I mean, literally like blurred vision and not being able to stand up straight. And I know that a lot of that comes from, you know, she's got some interesting dietary restrictions that, that impact her health and so forth. But, you know, for a head coach to have to be there for now, not just the open lifters, but the juniors and every master and so on and so forth. And they're holding attempt cards and it's like, man, and especially then if you have multiple lifters competing, you know, in a, in a flight and so forth, you know, or, you, or you've doubled up in a weight class and just tracking that and tracking all the other numbers, it, it can become quite fatiguing. And I remember by the end of the week, you know, in both of those instances, Angela was leaning on me and the other assistants heavily. You know, I, I mean, that was how that essentially birthed the relationship that I now have with Ray Williams, because she, she came up to me for that last session in South Africa and was like, I can't even see straight. Can you handle him? And I was like, I'd be honored to, of course, I already had Matt Bauer in that session. And so I was able to take Ray and, and wind up coaching him. And that became the genesis of our relationship, which is now extended, you know, to current day. So anyway, so yes, I, I, I have seen that live and in person and up close where these coaches, particularly on national teams, where they're required to be there for every session and every lifter, you know, and, and they should, they're commissioned to do so by their federation. By the end of the week, they are just literally just running on fumes. And so yeah. it is important. It is important in those instances, obviously, to do as much self-care as you can, but then also to strategically lean upon and lean on your support staff. And, and rather than shy away from that, lean into it and say, look, I've got people that are here to help with loading and some of the number crunching and stuff like that so that I can take a little bit of that off of my plate to help me make effective decisions at, in, the, in the most critical moments. Yeah. Right. And I try to do that. I try to do these things. As, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's not unlike, I mean, in, in some ways, while I'm certainly not in charge of a national team, when we go to our USA nationals now, you know, and we're there for, now it's usually four days or something along those lines. You know, oftentimes I have 15 to 20 lifters. And now with these multiple platform events where sometimes we've got four platforms running at one time, if I'm, you know, in Las Vegas, I was quadrupled up in a single session where I had lifters going on almost every platform in the same session and, and it unfortunately in different flights. And so when there's just Susie and I, I mean, we're running around, you know, trying to cater to many different lifters. And so it, it does, it tests you. Um, and so um, it's funny because when we have a prospective lifter that comes to us and is kind of one of these add-ons at the last second, I kind of reassure them. I'm very transparent with them. And I'll say, hey, just in the issue of transparency and full disclosure, I have another lifter in your session, but I want to let you know this isn't our first rodeo. And so you need not worry about our game day product. We are going to be there for you and we're going to be able to make good decisions. Some. So anyway, it's, it, all that is to say is that we just have to be mi mindful of it and kind of prepare for it. Yeah. yeah definitely. Do you, well, one thing I really enjoy about your writing is that it's full of, uh, it's full of stories, you know, like you, you have lots of experiences and you're very willing to share those experiences. Uh, it makes for interesting reading too. Um, do you have anything in particular that stands out to you as like a, um, a particular moment when that decision making made an outsized impact? I mean, I have a recent example <laughs> for myself, but um yeah, I guess maybe to, to put a, a finer point on it, like we know it's not always the literally the strongest person that wins the powerlifting competition. Being strong is an important part of it, but it, it's the best powerlifting competitor that, that wins the powerlifting competition. Um, do you have an example of uh, kind of a situation that you were in uh, where, you know, a lifter that you were coaching was able to outcompete uh, somebody who was you know, kind of an on paper, stronger lifter. Yeah. So I, I mean, 
I don't want to sound like a broken record and say, oh, and you know, in the book, but I'll just refer to two <laughs> prime examples that were that were also in the book for and perhaps, you know, to illustrate to those who haven't read that chapter yet or what have you, but they're they're two really good examples. The first one that comes to mind is um, you know, coaching Ellis McLean at 2017 IPF Worlds in, in Belarus. And so on paper, I I do, I, I want to say he might have been nominated <clears throat> fourth or fifth. But to make a long story short, I mean, he, he literally and figuratively had no other advantages in that competition other than the fact that he was going to be the best bench presser. And that's usually not an ace card that you would consider, right? Because you're building the bulk of your total through your squat and your deadlift. So LS was eighth after squats. We moved into second place at subtotal because his bench was so good. But he dropped to third after opening deadlifts, fourth after second deadlifts, and we were still able to engineer a victory for him. And so it, it, it was just through strategic attempt selection and me also knowing our competition and being mindful of the situation that, and, and I'm not saying that was all me. I mean, it wasn't, you know, LS had to go out and he, he had an eight for nine days. That's a, that's a damn good day, especially all the way on the other side of the world, Right. He had to go out and execute those lifts. Um, but, you know, it was one of those situations after his second deadlift where we were in fourth place. And I'm thinking at that point, I've got to get this guy on the podium. Like the goal is I've got to get him from fourth at least into bronze, at least get him up there. And because I know what these other guys are capable of and I've watched their second attempts and I have a really good idea of what I think they have left in the tank, I need to put a sure thing on the bar for LS for his third attempt because, you know, he's not known as a, he's not a bad deadlifter, but he's not a great deadlifter like some of these other people were. So he's going to have to play his cards and his hand first. And so I had to put a sure shot on the bar and LS will tell you just as I illustrated in the book that he was not happy about that at all. Um, he was, he was pretty salty <laughs> about the number that we chose and put in there. But it, it ultimately played into our favor win. because, well, you know, he wanted to go for a number that, uh, heavier than that, that, you know, he, he felt like in the moment, he felt like he was being held back a little bit. And I, I, I get that. And, and to an extent, we were. But in that situation, I have to put something on the bar that is as high probability of a make, Right, you don't want to give the competition away because if we miss our, our deadlift, then we're in fourth place. We're doing no better than where we are now. So I have to put him in a situation where he's going to make it. I have a really good idea that that at least two of these guys are going to miss, and 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 every time that bar hits the floor after a miss, you're climbing that podium ladder, if you will. And so it worked out in our favor, and 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 unbeknownst to us, eventually one of the team coaches made a math error, and we came into first place. And so his scowl that he kind of gave me when he came off the platform, I was pretty certain that was going to fade. And, and, you know, he'd be, he'd be smiling and, and singing our praises when that national anthem was going off. So um, it worked out in our favor. That was an instance. And then another one that's uh, in recent memory was coaching uh, Bryce Lewis at the 2019 USAPL nationals against Ashton Ruska. And so, Clearly on paper going into that meet, even though Ashton was, you know, kind of new to the 105 category, he was known as this, you know, just behemoth of strength. And on paper, the sum of his PBs added up to a total greater than what we could do. And, and, and he had demonstrated that in, you know, so the only advantage we had was lot number advantage. And we leveraged that to our advantage in the end and essentially forced Ashton to put a number on the bar that he didn't want to take. And it was actually more than he needed, but because we had lot number, he couldn't go down in weight and take the actual weight that he needed. So we were able to engineer a victory that way as well. So it's just kind of, you know, I, I talk about before the competition actually begins, you know, when we're in the warm up room, one of the first things that I do is, is look at the, the scoreboard on the display or the monitor, you know, in the United States, that's usually lifting cast internationally. It's usually good lift. And so I immediately take an inventory of where my lifter is with regards to the other contenders, obviously what our objectives are. And in the case of those lifters that I just mentioned, when we have the opportunity 
to potentially win, then I'm immediately looking for what advantages do we have? And Mike, to your point, the single greatest advantage is, is being matter of factly the strongest guy or gal in the room. And so that that's tough to overcome when that lifter doesn't make mistakes. Now, if that lifter makes mistakes or they submit poor attempts, then I can use these other ace cards that are up my sleeve, like being the strongest deadlifter, like lot number, body weight advantage, and of course, chips and world records and so forth. I can use those. I can leverage those to my advantage to basically engineer victory, if you will, over a lifter who might be on paper more talented than us. So I just, that's what I encourage coaches to do is immediately in those situations where you're not just competing for PBs, I'm talking about higher level international competitions, is you immediately need to take an inventory and say, okay, where does my lifter stack up against these other competitors? And which of these chips, you know, literally and figuratively, which of these ace cards can I use to our advantage? So, yeah. you know, yeah. apologies for kind of jumping around a bit, but I keep having things pop into my head, questions that I want to know the answer to while we're talking. Um, <laughs> do you, so in a situation like what you described with LS, um, mm -hmm. where you're currently sitting in fourth and, you know, may, maybe this isn't the exact scenario, uh, but scenarios mm -hmm. are like it. Um, perhaps the grouping is pretty tight together, uh, but, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not exactly in the same place. Uh, you have an athlete who's sitting in, say, fourth place. Uh, mm -hmm. What sorts of factors do you include in your decision making to decide, you know, do you go for a, trying to put them on the podium, go for a bronze, maybe go for a silver medal, or do you take a bigger risk and swing for a gold medal? So, so that, that's an excellent question. And so let's rewind the tape for just a minute. So all of that, it's incumbent upon me to discuss that with the lifter beforehand. And so our, our strategic game planning calls are instrumental in uncovering the answers to those questions. And so the, the reason that I hop on those calls is obviously to install the game plan, but we do it beforehand. We do it, you know, typically it's within the last week of training when the majority, if not all of their heavy lifts are complete and, you know, and they're focusing on their taper and et cetera. But we can have this unemotional discussion where we're both of sound mind and rational thought and we're not in the moment and we can be completely objective in that moment and we can have play calls ready. You know, we, we install, you know, and look, I'm not saying that you can't call an audible or there aren't audibles that occasionally need to be called. And sometimes the lifter might change their mind in the moment. You know what I mean? Based on how they're feeling or performing on the day, but at least we have discussed these scenarios. And I will just matter of factly ask my lifter, Hey, what's most important to you? And let's create this hierarchy of goals, which gives us multiple opportunities for wins and, and successes. If, if we're not, you know, w winning literally by achieving the gold medal, like what is the most important thing to you? And so by having those discussions in advance, we can develop this hierarchy of goals, this strategy that's in, in place based on the scenario that you said. And, and I'll ask them, hey, if we're sitting in fourth, what's more important to you? Do you want to go all out and literally swing for the fences and try to take that number one position? Or are we going to think about just getting you on the podium? You know, and, and, and that those decisions and the answers to those questions might be very different for different level competitors and what, or I should say competitors of different experiences, because if, if this is somebody's first world championship, like they've never been, they might answer that differently and say, Hey, I, you know, gosh, I would just love to make the podium. You know what I mean? For somebody who's been and done this dance a few times and maybe they've placed second or third or what have you. And they're tired of placing second or third. They might say, yeah, hell I'm pushing my chips to the center of the table. I'd like a shot at first. And so I can't answer those questions for the lifter. Only the lifter can answer that. And it's after all, it's their competition and it's incumbent, on me, incumbent upon the coach to help engineer that performance, you know, and facilitate that. So I think by having those calls and having those questions answered in advance, 
then we can make the play calls on game day more adequately and effectively because on game day you're you're under a clock you know what i mean i've got yeah. we've got 60 seconds now again with the third deadlift i can change it twice but yeah so that's one of the ways that i help make those decisions mike and then also i'm looking at what our competitors are doing you know it's really important to watch second deadlifts of your competitors and if i can't get my eyes on them then i'm making sure that a my partner, you know, Susie is watching their third deadlift or their second deadlift rather to determine how much they have left in the tank. And that's where the scouting becomes critical. I think, because I know, you know, their normal attempt progressions, the, their rate of, of makes versus misses on final attempts, um, what their current PB is and, and what they might be doing to leverage, you know, a successful outcome for themselves. And so all of that kind of pours in, and then, of course, it goes without saying what I truly think my lifter has left. You know what I mean? If you want to go for the lift, for the win, and it takes 20 kilo jump, but you only have seven and a half, well, then, you know, you and I joke about this all the time. You can go out there and tug on the bar if you want to. <laughs> but, you know, we want to put something on the bar that's realistic. So. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you. It, I'm a little kind of off the wall question maybe for you is that um, how much do you try to maybe impart wisdom in some of these earlier, earlier calls where you're talking about priority and stuff. So we were discussing it at nationals, um, the increasing tendency for people to want to be like all or nothing in their, in their goals, you know, like I'm going to, mm -hmm. if I can't win outright with a Carpino one, then screw it. I don't care. You know, I don't, uh, the podium, uh, winning a national championship, none of that it matters to me at all. I only want this very highest achievement and that's it. And mm -hmm. I've, I've done a bit of thinking on this since the competition. And I suppose I've kind of softened my, attitude on it a little bit like i do understand to some extent the the mentality um the level of importance that people put on making a national team and fair enough and also it's worth noting that uh i was you know a, a 20 year old competitor at one point as well and mm -hmm. probably would have prioritized things in a similar way but at this point in my career i I feel like I have better perspective and I feel like I, it could, it maybe it's not better perspective. Maybe it's just a shift in values or something like that. But I do think there's something to be said for, you know, these other achievements that aren't necessarily the very highest one, you know, and there's value in being a national champion, even if that doesn't come with a Carpino one, there's value in being on the podium, even if it's not a gold medal, there's value in winning something, even if it's not with a world record, all these things, right? So to me, it makes even more sense to like in a situation, what you described with LS, you put on the bar what you need to place as well as you can. And maybe you would have liked it to be a bigger number. Mm -hmm. You, you take what's available, you, you know, and you're playing a bit of a probability game and these other achievements do have value. Uh, even if it's not, you know, the very highest you can. Anyway, and it's a lot of preamble to to my question. I guess what I'm wondering is like for you and your um, your coaching philosophy, do you try to get into that kind of guidance or do you pretty much let them choose what they want in terms of goal set? Um, I think it's a bit of both to be quite, <clears throat> to be quite honest with you. I think particularly, um, I, look, as, as a coach, I think you're always trying to impart wisdom, right? Based upon your personal experience and, and what, and, and what you've been through and, and what you've seen happen and so forth. And so I don't, I don't think that ever stops, but I think, um, as you impart that wisdom, um, to your point, based on the lifters experience and how many of these situations they've been in their answer to that question like you just alluded to could, could, could be very different. You know, what's important to, 
to Sean Jin, perfect example. We'll just call him out and use him as an example. And I've actually heard him on a podcast since the competition. So he competed in the 83 kilo class against Deuce Gruden, who Susie was coaching. And so, you know, it was a situation where, where Sean could have um, easily gone for the win. I, I say easily just because his, his second deadlift looked comfortable um, and, and, and Deuce was done. He'd already played his hand. And so he, he could have gone up just a little bit or make it, made a nominal increase and secured the W, so to speak, and become a national champion. But he pushed all of his chips to the center of the table and pretty much, you know, for lack of a better word, YOLO'd, if you will. Um, but it wasn't unreasonable. His second attempt looked really good. It was just a big jump, and he was going all in for that Carpino. So I think, I think also this year was a very unique set of circumstances where lifters were trying to shoot for this Carpino score, right? That's not going to happen every year. It happened because of the Sheffield and the timing of the Sheffield and all those sorts of things. So it really was this unique kind of year where there were two targets. There's the target of becoming a national champion, you know, which in theory should secure you a national team berth in any other year, you know, but now we also had this, this other target, which was the Carpino score that you were aiming for. And so, you know, you and I had this conversation over dinner and I, I tend to lean toward your line of thinking where, you know, look, there's only one day out of the year when you can become a champion and there's value in, in saying that I'm a national champion or I was a national champion in 2023. There's nobody that could ever take that away from you, regardless on how the remainder of your powerlifting trajectory or career arc takes. By the same token, this was one of those once in a lifetime opportunities or, or one-off opportunities wh where I've got this Carpino score and, and this was Sean's first opportunity at making an open team. And look, he felt like it was there and he took a shot. And so after listening to him on podcasts, like you, my opinion on that is kind of softened a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I don't, I don't blame him. I don't blame him at all. I mean, he, he took a shot and he came really damn close to that deadlift. Yeah. He just kind of lost his grip. And so it was, it was a realistic play, you know? So sure. yeah, I, I just think that I'm imparting with. Sorry, go ahead, Matt. Didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say. I suppose that I'm still imparting wisdom, but ultimately, mm -hmm. it is the you know, it is the person who's stepping onto the platform. It's their competition. I mean, don't get me wrong. I feel like as a coach, I'm competing as well, and because I'm really not competing anymore in lifting, this is this is a competition for me. And so, you know, I'm competing, and I want to bring forth the best for my athlete. But ultimately. They're the ones in the arena. They're the ones walking out on the platform, on the stage, doing the lifts. And I need to engineer and facilitate their goals as best I can. So ultimately, even if their goal is perhaps not what I would choose, it's their goal. And so I need to put them in position to achieve it if I can. Sure. I suppose uh, I'd like to kind of circle back onto that specific scenario too. Um, I had a, I was kind of armchair quarterbacking a, a bit because I was watching the session, you know, and I, when I saw yeah. Sean's third attempt deadlift come in, you know, I'm, I looked at it and thought, I wouldn't have done that, you know, understanding, you know, very little of the context. Like I understand the competitive scenario because I'm watching the competition and I know that, you know, it's, it's a swing for the Carpino rather than uh, going for the, for the win, but you know, in the moment, I thought I would not have done that. But that's also without knowing like what the specifics of his goals were, what his training was like, and and so on. Um, and I we probably have listened to the same interviews in, in the time since, and just kind of having some conversations about it. You know, it's not. I suppose my issues not so much with that specific scenario. That it makes sense to me that you know, why he chose to do what he, what he did. So look, sometimes you think it's there, you know? So uh, let me tell myself a bit here as well. So in 2013, we're at the world championship in Russia and um, thing, forget the exact made lifts and stuff like that is 10 years ago, but uh, uh, squats went, how squats went, bench went, how it goes. And um, we come into deadlifts and, um, I'm pretty sure it was down to me and 
Vilo Kristoff. Uh, and I made my opening deadlift. He makes his opening deadlift. We took what should have been a normal jump uh, to a second deadlift, and I dropped it. I could, just couldn't hold on to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so missed my second. And at that point, there was very little we could do. We missed it again on my third. Uh, and I remember he came up to me afterwards, you know, and, and said, you know, why you make such a big jump from opener to second attempt? Because it was more than what we would have needed if it was just about winning, right? And <laughs> my answer was like, well, I thought I could do it. <laughs> like very simply, <laughs> why did you jump that much? Because I thought I could do it, you know, like it. Right. I don't know what else to say. So, I mean, I've definitely been on that, on that end of it. And that's, and that's to me, a valid reason for picking a number in most, in most scenarios. Um, it was a bit unexpected to, you know, that was not, we hadn't had prior grip issues or any sort of reason to suspect that would be a thing. Anyway, that scenario aside, just to say that I've been in situations of like second guessing calls and stuff like that afterwards. But um, I suppose the, the main thrust of, Kind of what I'm thinking is is more the just a it seems like a tendency uh, toward really valuing the number one position and then not valuing at all anything that comes after that and kind of having been through that and um, hopefully being on the other side of it now uh, I think I see things a bit differently you know and being able to look back on a career and say you know I was a uh, 10 time podium finish at nationals or something like that is valuable, you know, and it's worth mm -hmm. like the, the, the high peaks are cool and you can't take anything away from that, but it's a different kind of achievement to build a longevity type of career. And that's something that it takes a long time to do. You can't just wait until the end of your career to decide to do that, you know? So anyway, there's my old man rant for the day, I guess. Yeah, no, I think you, you look, you make, you, you make some excellent points. And I think, you know, on balance, I mean, I, I think I'm in your camp as well. And I think, I think the longer that you do this, the more you're able to reflect obviously and look back and say, wow, you know, I've, uh, you know, I have a lot of, I had a lot of opportunities and a lot of times when I was, you know, the national champion or, or, Hey, place in second, you know, wasn't as, you know, like you, like you even said yourself, you've never been so happy this, this, you know, two weeks ago uh, about a second place. And that, uh, that in itself just speaks volumes. And it's, you know, you did the, the best that you could on that day, considering the circumstances and you overcame some back pain and some different, you know, physical challenges. And it's just really freaking cool that you've had the meat that you had and were able to engineer a second place there. And it's really, it's just, you know, which is awesome because I know there was a time in your career when you looked at second place and you're like, man, this really sucks. You know what I mean? And it's like, <laughs> you know, I think a, a, a good example, you know, a good example when looking at a different sport, you know, people talk about the greatest golfer of all time. And a lot of, you know, it's this argument between kind of Jack Nicholas and Tiger Woods. And so when, you know, it's terms of greatness. And so when you look at Jack Nicholas's career in terms of majors, but also look at how many times he came in second. It's astounding at how many times he came in second place. And it's like, just to think, you know, I know golf is completely different than powerlifting. And in a, in a round of golf, you've got between 60 and 80 opportunities, depending on how good of a golfer you are roughly. And in powerlifting, you only have nine, but it literally does can come down to just a shot here or there or a lift here or there. And it's like, man, second place ain't so bad. And it's like, you know, I don't know. It's just, yeah, no, yeah. I, I'm with you. So, it, it, it's a good bumper sticker to, you know, first or nothing. If you ain't first, you're last. Well, right. I mean, yeah. the reality is just a little bit different than that. You know, it, you yeah, know Bryce Lewis sure. sent me a podcast quite a few years ago now. It was talking about, it, it was, it was a, like a psychological investigation on second place finishes at the Olympics. It turns out that mm -hmm. silver medalists are the least satisfied with their performance. Obviously, gold medalists right. are the most, and bronze medalists are pretty happy too. 
you know, but silver medalists are, are usually the, yeah. the salty ones. And man, that resonated yeah. with me so much, you know, and I've told lifters yep. about this endlessly. They're probably sick yep. of me saying it, but you know, I've got the pictures and, you know, looking grumpy on second place podium, but, um, a little bit of perspective goes a long way on that. You know, it's like, you know, next year you might be, might not be here at all. You, you can't predict that and you can't control it to a more, to a greater extent than we care to admit sometimes. So, mm -hmm. you know, Susie really helped, uh, helped me frame like my own competition results in a productive way. I think you know, focusing on, my own performance did i did i lift well or not you know and that's the sort of thing that i can control and you know you know another person that we talk to uh about stuff like this quite a bit is newton chang and he talks about mm -hmm. uh, he wants to represent himself and his training well and that's his primary goal for a competition and he may have other intentions you know he may intend to you know squat a pr or something like that but uh, the goal is to lift to your lift to your ability, you know, and really maximize mm -hmm. your ability on the day, and control your controllables basically. And you know, if you do that, then that's that's worth being satisfied about. And there may be other things that are, uh, you know, that that require attention that you may want to fix or change or something like that later. But it's not worth beating yourself up over like I, i've got a i've got an athlete now actually who uh recently had a competition didn't go the way he wanted it to and you know it's been some some weeks since then and still like he's feeling um like he didn't measure up and there's a difference between evaluating your training evaluating your attempt selection evaluating your approach and internalizing it and feeling like uh, your personal shortcomings or your personal uh, sort of value uh, either wasn't enough or wasn't uh, the thing that measured up. It, there's a big difference in those things and it'll, it'll affect mm -hmm. your satisfaction after the, the competition's over, which is, you know, that's the thing that's worth having, but it'll also impact, your future performances, if that's the only thing that you care about. Right. Yeah. And I think there's a, I think there's a, there's a beauty in like what you said, Mike, in representing yourself well and competing to the best of your ability. And if you have literally risen to the, you've given the most of yourself on that day and you've squeezed as much out of that, you know, lemon as possible, so to speak, it's like, man, what, what can you be upset about? Like, it's like, I got the most of what I could give today under these set of circumstances, whatever they might be advantageous or disadvantageous. And it's like, Hey, that that's the total that I put out there. And I, I think there's great satisfaction in knowing, wow, I did the very best that I could do, you know? Yeah. And if that meant I came in fifth, then I'm fifth. And if I came in first, then I'm first, you know? Right. So right. that's a hard attitude to, to adopt. Like I, I don't want to diminish that aspect of it. Like I, I've known this in my head for a while <laughs> yep. and it's, it's yeah. frankly tough to fully believe the thing that you want to believe in this case. Um, but mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a thing that's worth working at. I think it comes with, with age and experience, which is to say that I'm just old. <laughs> so. <laughs> so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to add another uh, flavor to this. Um, I remember a conversation with a lifter at a, uh, a nationals and I remember squeezing every little bit out of the squat and we were so happy with how squat went and we get to bench and he's got a number, you know, he's got this number that he's been chasing for a long time and it's, it's burning in his mind. You can see him in the warm up room. Just he's, he's like excited, nervous, you know, and we get there, we get seconds out of the way. And now that number is looking like it's possible on, on this third bench. And I remember saying to him, I would feel more comfortable hitting this number 
because I, I 100% know that you have it today. But if you look back and you hit this number and you could have eked out another two and a half a week from now, two weeks from now, would you feel upset about it? Even if that means that there's a possibility you can miss. And I remember that conversation really well with him. And he said, John, if we don't load it up, I'm going to regret it. No matter what the outcome of this meet is, I'm going to regret it. If that means that drops my opportunity on deadlift, it drops my position down to fifth, it's going to bother me. And I remember that conversation. I said, okay, let's load it up. He did miss. Yeah. Um, but he was so happy because he's like, I finally loaded this thing up that I got to fight for. And I've not had this chance before. And quite frankly, he hasn't had a chance to since. And he was a junior at the time. And I remember thinking about that in recent years, thinking this is an athlete who didn't get that chance again. And we often think about like not getting the chance to go for something that stretches us when we think like later years, later in the open, you know, later in master's years, but that could happen too. Cause you don't know where life's going to take you. You don't know what life could present you. And when are you going to have this chance again? So I think about that with Sean and I think, he thought he had a chance and, and I kind of get it. I get it to a certain extent and, you know, weighing out all of those contextual goals I think is important. And like you said, Matt, I think it's, it really comes down to the athlete and their drive. And if there's something that you can do beforehand, and, and I know Matt, you do this with the hierarchy of goals. If you can sit back and think after today, what will I be most happy about? Mm -hmm. And after today, what would I most regret? And I think that if you look at that, you yeah, I agree. I think that's an journey. excellent perspective. I th I th it's, yeah, it's an excellent perspective. And I think we probably see this. It's funny that you bring up the bench press. I think I think a lot of us see this more so in the bench than in other lifts, right? Because it it always seems like we're just the the the, the solving that bench press riddle or 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 tackling the bench press is it's like it's this big block of ice, and we've got you know, a, an ice pick and we're chipping away at it. And it's like, seems like such a long slog to break off a big chunk. And so it's like, man, you, you look at a lot of lifters in their meat stats and it's like, they wind up benching the same numbers over and over and over again. And sometimes for a couple of years before they have a significant breakthrough, but to your point, John, and I, I agree with, with your take on this at some point, if you think it's there, you got to freaking load it up, man. You, right? You, that's what we all want to do. That That's at our core is the PB, the PR doing something we've never done before. And sooner or later, you got to take a shot at it. Like, cause like you said, you know, regret the, the pain of living with that regret for a long time is it sucks. And so eventually you, you got to take a shot at it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, that's my story too on my to date personal best uh, deadlift is that you know, it was a yeah. competition where it was kind of on the other end of it, you know, that I came into the competition kind of dinged up. I had recently been hurt and so didn't really train a whole bunch. And it was a minor competition, so it wasn't a big peak anyway. And uh, but things were just kind of going well, you know, when we same sort of thing. I, Arian Kamisi was uh, handling me at the time mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. we called for something like five kilos below my personal best deadlift. Uh, for a third attempt and we're just kind of staying there waiting and we're like wait a minute this is done <laughs> there's nothing on the line here you know we should at least yeah. go for it you know so loaded mm -hmm. up and went for it uh got a personal best deadlift and you know haven't haven't been in the neighborhood since you know and i mean you don't expect that you know a lot of times those opportunities come up and and you don't necessarily know that that that's what you're dealing with, you know, uh, life can get in the way, uh, things can happen that are, you know, just unexpected. So yeah, it, it totally get it. To I think that's a big thing is just take advantage of it when it's there. And John, I particularly like your, your framing of it too. Uh, and I, I feel like that also worked out to my advantage in kind of the first competition back that I did. Um, so again, yeah. We're getting down to deadlifts, this you know, third attempt deadlift time. And uh, I called for 865 on my third attempt deadlift. Uh, second attempt deadlift moved about how you would expect the second attempt to move. Uh, it wasn't particularly good or bad. It was pretty nominal. Uh, so it took a, you know, a normal jump that brought me to 365 for a third attempt deadlift. 
And I'm looking at my total. If I make it, it's going to give me an 895 total. And I'm thinking, oh, man, can I, can I take five more kilos and get that 900? Can I take it? Maybe. Can you stretch for it? And, you know, I was kind of coaching myself because it was low stakes and, you know, not a lot was, it was my first competition back. So um, I kind of grabbed a, a friend of mine who was nearby and was like, hey, look at this, look at this second attempt. Do you think I should put in a change and go for 370 on my third? Try to get that 900. And he said the exact same thing to me as Hanny. And he, he says, uh, uh, which, which kind of negative scenario would you be uh, most upset about? That you hit 365 and you, you hit it and you go, yeah, I could have done five more. You know, could have had it, but didn't. Or uh, you load up 370 and miss. You know, which would you be more upset about? And I thought uh, the miss 370 would definitely be more of a bummer than, you know, than hitting 365 and kind of knowing it was there. So I mm -hmm. ended up staying with it and totaled 895 and was very happy about that outcome. Uh, so I thought that particular framing of the, the options was really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's also something, there's also something to be said when it's the, when it's your very last lift of the competition, right? It's the last one of the day. I think, I think we can all identify with the fact because we've missed different lifts at different times. There's a very different feel of missing a, a third bench versus a third deadlift, right? It's just this, because it's, it's literally the last taste in, that you have in your mouth from the competition. So when you come off the platform, you're like, doggone it. You know, you missed my last one. I went eight for nine. You know what I mean? Whatever. And it becomes this negative thing when in reality, hey, man, eight for nine is pretty daggone good. But an eight for nine where you missed your, your third bench or, or maybe your third squat or something is a, is a different feel because then you're like, oh, wow, I finished on a high note. So that can take yeah. on a different flavor depending upon the circumstances. But yeah. I agree with you. Another I think you made thing the right that decision. I learned from <laughs> another thing I learned from Bryce is uh, the kind of the human. I guess it's a bias or a cognitive bias about uh, the peak end rule. I think is what it's called, where we tend to frame mm -hmm. our experiences. Kind of we consolidate these bigger experiences into like what was the peak of the experience, and then how did it end, uh, and that tends to shape, you know, shape the overall. Uh, framing of it you know so if you have a if the peak is a negative and you end on a negative then you know the the rest of the middle could have been fine or even moderately positive but you, but that'll shape how you view the the entirety of it you know and that's you could go you could have a seven for nine day that's a decent day overall but feel very negatively about it because you miss you know, in fact I keep bringing up all these uh competition recent competitions that I've done. So apparently still processing all this, <laughs> but that was kind of my competition <laughs> in November, you know, I missed the third squat and the third deadlift. It was okay. But my feeling in the aftermath of it was, you know, fairly negative. Like, yeah, this didn't go very well. And I mean, it didn't go great, but you know, in you put a little bit of distance between, uh, if I put a little distance between me and the event and try to have a bit of perspective, you go, eh, it was okay. You know, but the feeling uh, when the peak end is not working out in your favor is, is a bit different. And I guess you could try to engineer your experiences to avoid some of that. If that was a primary goal, I'm not sure that that's a primary goal for very many people. <laughs> well, I, I think I can speak for John. Mike, when we say that we're, we're happy to be here to help you work through your feelings, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I especially on this, psychiatrist. On the, yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. just going to yeah. say, that's the reason why this podcast exists. It's to <laughs> process Mike's emotions on performance yep. and training block. No. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to send you an invoice after, after the podcast drops. Yeah, you should we'll rename the podcast. Mike's <laughs> therapy hours. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh man. That's great. Yep. I actually had a question for you, Matt. Um, speaking of why we have the podcast and why you have the game day 
uh, manual that you created, your, your book. Why now? Why did you write it, release it now? I mean, you've been at the pinnacle of game day coaching for a long time. What made you decide to do it at this point in time in your career? And like, what drove that's you a, to that's write a really this good question. I think I've known for quite a while that I was going to write it. Um, you know, in 2012, I, I became the coaching chairman and coaching certification director for USA Powerlifting. And in doing so, I was charged with uh, basically uh, revising and rewriting the, the course curriculum. And so I didn't do that alone. I did it with four other people who contributed to that. And so in that process, I thought to myself, you know, I have this passion for game day coaching and that's kind of, that's my it. That's what gets my motor running. I would really like to write something specifically on, on the topic, you know, at some point, but, you know, simultaneously, Susie and I are running SSPT in Maryland and, you know, as life takes different turns and so forth. And so that can got just kind of kicked down the road, if you will, for lack of a better analogy. And, but now I really in earnest started thinking about the project a, a whole lot more probably over the past two or three years. And I think it was really instrumental in kind of when I told some key people and key figures in my life. I mean, I like playing my cards close to my vest and, and, and not letting the cat out of the bag first, but you kind of, you know, you want to get some feedback like, Hey, is this, is this worth doing? Is this worth talking about? Is this a worthy pursuit? And I remember when I mentioned it to Mike and I mentioned it to Eric Helms and Jason Tremblay who are three people that I lean upon lots of times for mentorship and for advice. And I remember kind of kicking it to them and, and they were like, heck yeah. Like, you know, and just, and just kind of affirmed it, it, it feels good when you have somebody who's kind of tracking with you and can verbally confirm and then affirm what you're thinking in your head. And so it's this reinforcement of, Hey, yeah, man, go for it. Like, and, and so I think to answer your question of why now is I received that affirmation and confirmation from them. And also just transitioning out here to Montana had a little bit more free time on my hands, um, getting our business set up out here. And um, just the landscape of powerlifting, I think over the last, you know, four to five years, I mean, over the last decade, but really more so in these last four to five years, it's really taken on a new shape in terms of just the amount of people that are doing it, um, the depth and quality of the talent pool now that we're seeing like never before. And so because that tide is rising, you know, literally and figuratively, it's like, I think game day coaching is now as important as it's ever been. And so because there was this scarcity in the marketplace also and scarcity in the powerlifting community, I mean, you know, there's texts and manuals out there on, on nearly every other aspect of powerlifting, but there wasn't one on this. And so receiving that confirmation from, like I said, a few of my trusted peers and friends and colleagues really was an impetus for me to write it. And, and I had a few people, you know, kind of say, Hey, like you're the guy to write this thing. Like that's your passion. It's what you do best. And so you're, you're the one to do it. And so that was kind of why now, and then strategically I wanted to release it before powerlifting American nationals, before the Arnold and before Sheffield. Cause I thought, wow, what a powerlifting month that we have upon us with these three huge competitions of, of importance and of value. Like, let me get the book done and drop it then so that it's fresh in everybody's mind and people can begin to utilize it and so forth. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of why the timing and kind of the reason and thing behind it. And I'm just, I want to lift up the community with it. You know, I, this isn't going to become some New York Times bestseller. I don't have any, you know, delusions of that. I realize that I am like the ultimate niche within a niche, so to speak. So it's like, you know, which is kind of cool though. So I feel like I can speak to those things. And so I'm just excited to, to hopefully lift the community up and educate some people, both lifters and coaches alike, and um, have it also be a positive thing that's kind of left behind in terms of legacy. Absolutely. Well, man, I, you know, gotta say that I really enjoy your writing. Um, you know, I'm like John, I'm working my way through it and, uh, um, mm -hmm. I've really enjoyed what I've read so far. It's interesting and it contains so much of, uh, 
the information that one would need to implement a system like this. So you're, you're really effective in terms of uh, describing it in a way so that it's useful to people as well. So um, really appreciate you. appreciate you writing it. I appreciate you being here today and, and helping me with my mental issues. <laughs> um, yeah, man, uh, it's really enjoyable. Um, if somebody listening to this is, you know, the idea of you uh, having written a book is new to them and they want to pick that up, how do they go about finding you and finding the book? Yeah, the easiest way to 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 find me and 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 the book is either to go to our website, which is just supremesportspt.com, and if you want to purchase the game day manual, you can um, look at products and it's it's listed right there. And perhaps an easier way would just be to go on Instagram and click the link in my bio. And so I'm mlgary72 on Instagram, and you can find all of my offerings there. And I just will mention one more thing, if I may, is first of all, thank you both for having me. Thank you for your kind words. I'm also excited to announce, and I've said this on another podcast, I'm going to be adding some additional content to the book because I knew this would happen. <laughs> but when you write an informative, instructional how-to manual, I think, Mike, you can identify with this. It's impossible to think of like every little thing and every nuance and in, in, and in the context of game day coaching to uncover every single potential scenario. So while I covered most of the competitive scenarios that one might encounter going to PA nationals. I saw something that happened that I, I was like, Dan Conant, I forgot to include that in the book. So I, so I want to go back and include that. And then also at the Arnold, I saw something and now I'm just going to wait for Sheffield to be done because I know that we're going to have a couple scenarios at Sheffield that I'm going to want to discuss. So all that is to say is that anybody who's purchased the book already, you can expect later this spring. I don't want to give an exact date, but later this spring, um, a free updated version coming to your email box. And for those that are have yet to purchase the book and purchase it later this spring, naturally they'll get the new revised version. And so I kind of want to just give people that additional information and additional content at no additional cost. And so I'm, I'm really thrilled to kind of put fingers to keys, pen to paper, whatever analogy you want to use and just add these scenarios in. Man, that's fantastic. That's one of the things I really appreciate about uh digital media is that we're able to do stuff like that these days and that wasn't always the case yeah. so uh, yeah. good on you for um you know caring about the end product enough to do the additional labor for it and um yeah really looking forward to to that to hearing more of what you've got to say and um cool. thanks again for being here thanks john for being here thanks everybody for listening and uh, we'll see you guys next time <laughs>